и он нам представит, что нас ждет в ближайшем будущем, надеемся. Maybe one or two people here that uh, are from uh, from abroad, and uh, they will seem to not understand Russian. And I was advised that everyone knows English. So, and uh, this is this is the beauty of the international conference. So, um, this is the topic: the innovation and mobility, and it entails speaking about the future, speaking about the cities, and speaking about flying cars. So, let's see. Uh, what we can say about the future, and I want to open up by invoking the spirit of... What do I do? <laughs> so the spirit of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> he said that... Actually, Michael Porter, if you've uh, studied management and business, you would know this quote from Michael Porter, but it's originates, it originates from Abraham Lincoln, who said, the best way to predict the future is to make it. So is it okay with the mic? Cool. And um, when we were... And just before we dive into the future, I just want to get something over with. Just jump into the question. So when will smart cities have flying cars? This is the answer, in 2020. It will start in Dubai, in Dallas, in Los Angeles, maybe a couple of more cities, driven by the innovative city administrations and or driven by large corporations like Uber. And this is already a plan. It's been a long time dream but it's already a plan. So now that you know the answer to the uh, question uh, of my topic, uh, let's just um, entertain ourselves and look how else, instead of making the future, we can predict the future. So one of the ways is to actually look at today through the lens, through the eyes of the uh, past. And this is a drawing um, done by Jean-Marc Cotet, a painter in the end of the 19th century, um, about life in France in hundreds of years. So many of you would recognize what is on this picture. It is this. So let's see if you recognize what else was in this picture. This is the end of the 19th century. This is when Jules Verne was writing. So this is obviously, does anybody have, a, have an answer? Let's just, huh? Video conference. That's Skype. That's video conferencing. So just one step back. So you see how the mind works. They take big things, the big visible innovations that happened in the end of the 19th century. The telephone, the cinematography, they combine the two, the radio uh, maybe, and they, they, they actually combine the two and they derived this picture of the future, but the, what they underestimated was the radio. You, you still see the cables and you, th you would think that you would need a projector screen, which we by the way still need, but we don't need it for the video conferencing anymore. It's size, it's mobility, so a lot of things were neglected. Let's uh, look at this. Yeah, actually, if, if, while you're thinking, of course, this is the microscope, and, 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 and this, the present is much different from, the, from how it was looked at in the past. But, um, by the way, these pictures, I wanted to say, were, were lost. And they were recovered in the library by, who could guess, Isaac Asimov. And that's how they became uh, popular, because he basically published them. So, this one will be tricky. So, who would have the idea of what this is. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What? Car making. Car making. Vodka. Vodka making. <laughs> that, that is actually close, but it's not particularly vodka. Anybody else? Coffee machine. 
It's about food. Okay, here is how it looks in the, in the present. Does that help? It is meat. It's creating meat in laboratories. So the funny thing is that it's Coursera, yeah, <laughs> Udacity. So the funny thing is that you look, when you look really, really far in the future, you still tend to combine only the big visible stuff that you see in the present. You forget the side trends. That's what is ultimately and fundamentally wrong with these pictures. But you also overestimate what the future will bring if you look at the very, very far-fetched horizons. So obviously this has not happened yet. We don't, we cannot, we cannot, we don't have the download button to get the skills or the knowledge. And we still don't have that. And we don't have the moon bases and, uh, and we don't have the, the, the flights to Mars yet. The interesting study suggests that we also underestimate what can happen in the very near term, like one or two years. The change that one or two years bring is usually much more than people expect. The change that a hundred years bring is usually less. So let's look at flying cars. So let's look at what is it today? How does the industry look? What technology or what vehicles are emerging? And again, an old picture. This is the state of the industry. This is the state of the aerial vehicle industry today, which you can see very easily. There is debate, there is experimenting, and there is uh, debate about the use case and experimenting with design. So um, ultimately, like a hundred years ago, uh, people were playing one we uh, three wheels or four wheels, steering stick or steering wheel, putting the driver back, putting the driver in the front, putting the driver up. S in a similar manner, while all bundle of technologies is already available to bring about the long-awaited dream of personal flying, the industry is developing the vehicles, betting, making a bet on what will be useful in the near future. So you can clearly see patterns. Does it have a laser pointer, by the way? No, no. okay. Um, then you can easily see the one design thinking, let's create a distributed electrically propulsed helicopter. Just create a lot of rotors, they're fixed position. They always have to provide thrust to counteract gravity. They operate like drone by tilting a little bit. You sort of cre you create the horizontal movement and you create excessive redu redundancy for safety. Uh, as with all of the designs, you never compromise safety. But then you cannot use the um, aerodynamic lift that can be done, uh, can be provided by a fixed wing or a foil. So the next line basically explores the opportunity to have the uh, either different screws or different thrusters for vertical hover mode and horizontal flight. So uh, you either uh, have different thrusters, like this is Aurora Flight Sciences, recently acquired by Boeing. So you have a, one set of thrusters that provide vertical lift, and then there is a thruster to push um, the vehicle to achieve the horizontal flight. Then you have Vahana uh, Airbus that tilt shifts, uses the same rotors for both for vertical flight and then it tilt shifts it horizontally, but then it also tilt shifts the, the wing. And then you have Larry Page's investment uh, uh, into Cora, Z Aero. They use same thrusters uh, to have the um, uh, they just ju they just change the thrusters. So and then finally you have uh, other designs, and uh, this is again Airbus. 
They, they're making a bet that we will be driving on these carts in a capsula and the same capsula will be detached from the cart and then delivered by what is essentially a, a drone-like uh, platform. Then you have Lilium Jet uh, that uh, makes a bet on impeller um, uh, type of engines that provide much less noise at uh, lesser efficiency, but they compensate it with larger wingspans. And then this is us, Martini. And we bet on very, very narrow use case of mass urban aviation operated in a mass grid. Basically, we are making a London, uh, a London cab type of car, uh, optimally uh, uh, designed to um, suit this use case. And just to give you an idea of how fast things can move in the industry, now these, there are 30 companies in the field altogether that are producing these electric vehicles um, for, for the mass urban aviation. Um, five of which, about five or six, have full-scale prototypes. The rest are different prototyping phases, us included. This is what Lilium was, and this how Lilium was in one year's time only. This is how we like, we are, we are designing our vehicle in the largest European prototyping center in the center of Moscow. It's, um, uh, uh, National Technological University, MISIS, it's the prototyping center. And just to give you uh, a snapshot at where we are, uh, let's just uh, entertain a little movie. So how do we, does it start like this? Thank you. Mm. Hmm. How do we start a video? Intriguing. Any other suggestions? Hmm. Because you're speaking English, it doesn't understand. Tap Ruski Nashnom film to them. Okay, while we are starting the movie, um, let me just give you an idea of how you will use it. Uh, this actually goes about all the, the general specifications for all the aircraft that are being emerged. So you will go out of your, of your house, you will most likely have already ordered a vehicle uh, by a mobile app. It, uh, in, in three minute walk there will be a landing pad uh, where the vehicle will be already waiting for you. It may be autonomous, but most likely it will be piloted at the early stages, or maybe you will be the pilot because it will be very easy to get that piloting license because the vehicle, it will be very easy to operate. Um, very much akin to a uh, ordinary drone. And why it will be easy to operate is because it has this distributed electric propulsion that base and the flight controller one of, the, one of the technologies that enabled these devices that allow the vehicle to stay airborne, not requiring a pilot to do anything to keep it airborne. So the pilot only needs to know the navigation rules, which uh, the uh, system can help to comply with. And uh, the um, uh, pilot needs to direct um, the vehicle or to where uh, they need to go. And here's the movie. Uh, back to the construction yard, back where most of the industry participants are at.
So just one of the things to consider, most of the parts exist in the uh, three-dimensional uh, design uh, representation and can be manufactured by automated robots. And just to give you a feel, this, uh, this covers the span of three to four months work. So this is now what is called the half-scale uh, functional prototype. Um, and, and it's about three quarters of a movie. So um, neurophysiologists say that if something is unfinished, then you remember it better. So let's, um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you, okay, anyway, let's go on. Um, so, um, Basically, just to give you an, a, a, an idea of how a startup is operating its business, we made a bet. Uh, we made a bet that a smaller footprint is more important than universal energy efficiency. So we are not energy efficient and, uh, uh, because you don't see the large wings, only the body is the wing. It, it is um, energy efficient, it, it uses the lift of the body only at higher speeds, which we believe will be required. You, need, you will, we will be able to cross the city in less than 10 or 15 minutes, almost any city in the world, but um, at the lower speeds it will not be efficient. For that you get the lower footprint, uh, um, the smaller footprint. And another bet we are making is that we actually believe that hydrogen fuel cells are the new technology of storing and using energy rather than lithium-ion cells. And that makes our design more centered around the compartment where you would put the hydrogen uh, fuel cells. You have Toyota Mirai, you have Honda recently this year already um, driving on the streets of California and London uh, on pure hydrogen. Gives on one um, refueling of hydrogen gives you 1,500 miles. Uh, and that is amazing technology. It is still, as we believe, sponsored by the manufacturers just to be on the first sort of, um, uh, uh, just to be first in this arena. However, this technology is already mass implemented. So it is, as we believe, on the steep um, curve of becoming more affordable. Um, so when we say 150 kilometers, that's with uh, lithium batteries, when it is hydrogen, it suddenly becomes five to 600 kilometers. So uh, we already discussed the use case. So you will, uh, the vehicle will lift you up, will deliver to the closest um, uh, point, the to closest to your destination, you will land vertically, and off that uh, point, it will be, as we hope, three to five minute walk, which uh, you can also uh, cover uh, most likely on electric bikes with maybe Boston Dynamics robots carrying your luggage. Uh, just as a vision, there are certain challenges. Charging is one thing. It's 85 kilowatt, just a kilowatt hours battery. Current chargers, like if you, the ones that you see in the cities, they're 22 kilowatt per hour. So it, will, it would take three to four to five hours to charge with that one. It's not feasible. The superchargers are, can, are able to deliver more energy per minute of charging. Uh, and um, uh, that technology is promising, uh, although it is of course up to the city grids to be able to provide so much electricity at a point in time. So there may be other Technologies, and like we already discussed, look at side trends. How do you 
deliver so much electricity. Maybe use ultra capacitors that would accumulate slowly and then charge it into the car at a short uh, distance. Or maybe the innovation comes from completely different side trend, delivery, wireless delivery of energy through a laser beam. It's already been uh, implemented for small drones or infrared beam or even a, an induction high frequency uh, electromagnetic field. So there may be other ways to deliver uh, electricity to a vehicle rather than using this plug. While at the same time this plug is also good, it already exists. It's, it's the technology developed by the company called ChargePoint, which is uh, the supplier of uh, charging stations. Uh, and this should give you a feel that everything that we are talking about now exists. There, it is about creating the most useful and uh, the most capable bundle and to scale it and to implement it in the cities. So uh, let's talk about autonomy. That's another issue that uh, many people are interested. And from the economic standpoint, removing the pilot from, from the equation gives probably three to four times cheaper flight. Um, another question is, um, like driving, uh, self-driving cars, the technology is not there. In uh, autonomous flight, technology is there. Autopilots are there for almost a decade. Still, it's nowhere in the world it is allowed to put a passenger in an aerial vehicle, in an aircraft, pilot. So it's a lot about regulation. At the same time, we believe that as soon as it is mass, as soon as it is useful, as soon as it is proven that uh, it can fly autonomously uh, using the systems, the pilot will be removed. I mean, we will, as consumers, we will demand that from the regulator and it will be a political burden not to remove the, the pilot. So we believe that there will be manual controls because we all will love to steer it. We believe that the pilot skill level will be quite low, so most of the people can be pilots, get that license in several days, m possibly literally several days of training. And the adoption curve may first remove the pilot from the cabin and make a pilot uh, servicing, one pilot servicing many vehicles through a dispatch center and then remove uh, the pilot completely for, for a mass urban sort of shared network in the city and there will be artificial intelligence part of autonomy uh, where you would be able to say not go there land there by coordinates but simply land somewhere where it is convenient or land somewhere where it's a um, good view and it will come sooner than many think so this is the view with which we are we are operating or um, with which we believe there is a huge market and just for you to give a feel the urban mobility market is six trillion dollars and it may be one or two trillion dollars how many uh, that's how much passengers may pay per annum for urban air mobility in the next uh, and that we can come to that point in the next three to five maybe seven years and uh, when passenger when you will order a flight from A to B the interesting thing is that it is not only the vehicle if you had the vehicle today it would be most likely useless to you you, there is no infrastructure and while you can l think about these vehicles as a better helicopter that replaces for example the business helicopter uh, market but you will that adoption curve doesn't give you the full potential doesn't unleash the full potential of the new use case so to have the full the fully usable scenario where we literally don't need roads anymore you need a network of landing pads charger stations and of course fleets of vehicles operated in, um, uh, in the city, in the urban environment, which means that there are three types of regulation involved. So um, the vehicles themselves need to be certified with all the passenger aviation considerations in, in, in mind. The airspace has to allow these massive vehicles. Just to give you an idea, there are 5,000 commercial aircrafts operating in the US under the supervision of the Federal Aviation Authority. It is calculated that to serve only Dallas, uh, 
maybe 50,000 vehicles will be required. So the, this, the systems that are currently in place for certification of the vehicles and for managing the airspace have to be scaled dramatically. Not to say that nobody understands how to do that, but uh, not to say that technology is not there to underpin such scaling, but just imagine the sheer uh, task at hand. Finally, last but not the least, the cities themselves have to allow new types of infrastructure previously unheard of. The architectures, the um, ar architects, the chief architects of the cities, they barely allow helipads with all the noise they bring, with all the um, safety considerations, uh, with all the uh, safety considerations from the, from the uh, vehicle, but also from helipad being a refueling station, for example. Um, so, uh, there, okay, fuel is out of the equation for electric vehicles, but still uh, there are noise considerations and uh, there are vehicle safety and operation efficiency considerations. So, consider that three regulators have to talk. And they talk. Uh, the ruler of Dubai, uh, Sheikh Mohammed, uh, wants to have the air taxi by 2020 in Dubai. There is a big exhibition expo 2020 and the air taxi is to be operational. Uh, Mike Rowling, the mayor of Dallas, uh, wants the air taxi started by 2020 by Uber in his city. Uh, Nicholas Zenstrom, who invested in Lilium, uh, he's a co-founder of Skype, um, wants to have Lilium flying in as many cities as possible. And um, Federal Aviation Authority Chief Dan Elwell um, is looking at the industry and trying to solve the puzzle how to scale beyond those limits that are currently uh, FAA is operating upon. Uh, there are a bunch of industry regulators. All this, uh, the, the, the last pictures are taken at Uber Elevate Summit, where, uh, which took place this year, already the second Uber Elevate Summit, where administrators from five cities discussed practical ways to implement the new infrastructure, the new regulation in their cities. And Mike Moore is a NASA engineer with 30 years of experience who basically uh, switched his job from NASA to Uber to have what he was working on as from the technology side be implemented on a practical side to, trans to transport passengers. So, and, and there are many, many, many more people who are every day working to make you and us fly in an affordable manner in the city. So, here we come to the cities. And just to give you a hint, let's, we're, we're diving in a very interesting topic. Uh, the cities have problems. And those problems are congestion and pollution. These are the in almost every city, the larger the city grows, it's congestion and pollution. It's always. And there are metrics how you measure congestion and pollution. You measure them by rerun ratio. That's basically how much more you have to drive compared to direct sort of measurement between the two uh, spots uh, in the city. Uh, the average ground speed that you can achieve in, the, in different parts of the day. The uh, commute time for average commuter. And air pollution. Congestion and pollution is something urban planning conferences are always talking about for the last hundred years. This is a picture again taken in the end of the 19th century. That is New York. New York produced, not New York produced, all the horses in New York produced, think of it, 1,000 tons of manure per day. Okay, again, one million kilos of horse manure per day. What do you do with that? To find an answer to that question, uh, there was this uh, urban planning. And, and that was about the time these, these vehicles were emerging. Remember, it's, it's happening a century ago, slightly more. So uh, they have convened a first ever urban planning conference. It was supposed to go for seven days and the if not, but only question was, what do we do with horse manure? In London, in New York, and other emerging big cities. 
The conference was dismissed in three days because everybody concluded there is no solution. Uh, horseless carriages, maybe that's a solution. Horseless carriages, kind of a new idea. You can have a carriage without the horse. No, the horse is there to stay and automobile is a fad was an advice from the president of the Michigan Savings Bank given to a lawyer, uh, Horace Rackham, a lawyer of Mr. Ford. When m the lawyer of Mr. Ford was considering maybe it's worth the while to invest in Ford Motors Company. The horse is there to stay. Now there are good news, two good news. One thing is the lawyer did invest, he didn't, he didn't sort of listen to the banker. Um, and in less than five years, five six, five, six years, Ford Motors Company was producing almost a million vehicles per annum. There were, by that time, there were no horses in New York, no horses in London, and basically, look at side trends. Uh, when there is no solution, maybe a solution comes from very unexpected uh, thing, uh, unexpected area, like horseless uh, carriages. So solutions discussed for congestion and pollution today by the cities, by the urban planners, mobility experts, are about private transport and they are about public transport. Well, obviously, uh, we want private transport because we want to have some privacy when we, when we sort of commute, uh, when we transport ourselves. So public transport is, of course, a better use of the assets. Um, so uh, grid masters emerge that can provide you seamless transportation from one point to another uh, when you will change many modes of transportation in between. And, of course, in private transport, uh, Vehicle con connectivity would allow you to sort of choose better routes. Uh, electrification will make you emit less um, uh, gases into the atmosphere. Uh, car sharing makes the use of vehicle more efficient. Uh, so you would probably need less number of vehicles. And autonomous driving will save you the commute time and let you do something useful during this commute time. And if you, if you look at different solutions that are being discussed for uh, urban uh, transportation planning, it's about the use case. It's about the bet on the use case. It's about what we want as customers. We want seamless transportation on demand with a feel of privacy when we need it. That's basically what we want from, the, uh, uh, from transportation, be that private or public. And with this use case in mind, the urban air transportation thinking, design thinking, is emerging. So, uh, again, thinking about uh, passengers, their interaction with flying cars, hopefully seamless interaction with flying cars, the landing pads, the charger stations, and also uh, of the service personnel, also with the pilots, and also with the software layer that will serve mainly two areas. One area is to serve the operation of the grid, and another area is to serve the customer-facing part of the system. Order, billing, um, dispatch, basically availability of resource per demand, per location. And there are big ideas that emerge. Uber thinks that in Dallas, there will be maybe three, five large skyports that will be built to service 4,000 passengers per hour, 1,000 landings and takeoffs per hour. And these are the ideas of this uh, uh, that, uh, And the idea that you will take an Uber drive to this skyport, then you will have air navigation from skyport to another skyport, closer to your final destination, and again you will take a car. What about seamless here? So uh, maybe, just maybe, the vision is not that grand. 
Maybe it doesn't require billion dollars investments into big real estate. Maybe it doesn't require a lot of regulatory and managerial work. Maybe the idea is to have a little landing pad every three minute walk all over the city. Maybe have hundreds and thousands of them. How do you make that happen? Maybe you have um, a, an elevated landing pad. Maybe you have a rooftop landing, landing pad, but still small. How do you make that happen? Maybe you create a business opportunity. Maybe you let people build it. Maybe you don't. Maybe you make it decentrally. Maybe the whole infrastructure for our urban transportation is a business opportunity for, not for big corporations or administrators who will serve you flight, but maybe it's a business opportunity for um, uh, small and medium-sized businesses. So maybe that's the vision that we, are, uh, we can share. And with this use case in mind, that will, um, which, which we believe uh, in uh, McFly era will give you the faster adoption sooner in more cities and in a more affordable manner. Um, I want to uh, also emphasize, look at side trends. The most, I, I want to draw your attention, if you haven't read it, this book of Larry Keeley, 10 Types of Innovation. To that, that book dives into the subject that successful innovations, successful changes, they come not necessarily from product developments or technology implementations. They come from, in many respects, and in, in, many, in many instances, successful innovations are innovations of the business models. Innovations in packaging, innovations in structuring, basically innovations not in terms of what we make, but how we as society or as a group or as a company operate. And these innovation shifts bring about much more value to the economy and to our life than, um, uh, than, uh, than um, just simply product innovation. So um, have a look at the, at the book, there are many examples. So with this idea, sooner than later, and look at side trends, lo let's look at different technologies that emerge in different areas of life, different ideas that emerge in how people cooperate. And let's think, is it possible that urban flight is not a matter of large, big players and administrators agreeing long time ahead how they will, they will operate these uh, vehicles? Maybe it's a matter for uh, you and me. Uh, maybe it's a matter for us, understanding what B small business opportunities arise from, uh, from this new trillion dollar overall uh, f um, field. And maybe, um, and, and this, is, this is basically what we do in Markfly. We, we, are, we are a union of companies who develop bundle of technologies so that anybody in the city can take this bundle and ultimately deploy in their city or on their assets, an air taxi transportation service. So they can start a service or they can contribute their assets to a marketplace servicing this, uh, this, this transportation requirements. And if you have a landing pad, you can be rewarded every, every time the landing pad is used. If you have a charger station, you can be rewarded every time the charger is used. Or if you sell electricity, you will be rewarded for electricity. If you have if you, are, if you have a piloting license, maybe you will be a pilot on demand. Maybe you will be pooling with other passengers who don't have a license and get a flight for free. Maybe you are an architect that will make incredible designs for the landing pads and uh, agree with the city how to place them in this or the other city. So there are a lot of local diversities in different circumstances how the air transportation can emerge. And maybe it doesn't emerge in one big city immediately a thousand landings per hour. Maybe it emerges in so many different cities all over, all over the world, but maybe small scale. One, two landing pads just, just started off. And that experience from early flight will guide the regulator and guide other businesses to contribute their time, money, or physical resources that they have into these new emerging uh, systems. So, 
Um, and with, with this in mind, in uh, McFly era, we're as Bartini, Bartini is the developer of the vehicle, but we are part of this air technology incubator um, where we uh, want to empower communities all over the world. And one of the breakthroughs, if you like, uh, uh, one of the side trends that help this happen is the emergence of the concept of IoT, Internet of Things, Internet of Connected Devices, and blockchain, that is uh, a system that can be the operation support, but also provide business support system when you operate a large IoT network. So eventually, think of it as having a technology, a bundle of different technologies, with which on the body of the cities, there may emerge a robot, a decentrally managed market, uh, like supply and demand driven robot that delivers you from A to B. And with this, um, and this robot will be shared, will be uh, jointly owned by so many people who would find this as their own small business opportunity to sort of be part of that, of that robot. That's how we believe is also one of the ways in future people will jointly build large infrastructures. We used to delegate that power to others. We used to delegate resources so that somebody builds, centrally coordinates and builds a big infrastructure for us. Now it's the time, the social networks, the blockchain that allows transfer of uh, uh, tokens, of values, you can really have uh, large infrastructures built by small businesses. With this in mind, I always say hello to Peter Thiel. He was complaining that technology development is not fast enough. He said, we dreamt of flying cars, instead we got 140 char characters. So, flying cars are coming. I always say hello. And if you want to know what the future is, the best way to predict it is to make it. Thank you very much. It's a big problem. Uh, it's a big problem in the US. Uh, I live there and uh, I'm not satisfied with the uh, vegetables and fruits and I think if uh, farmers have opportunity to fly cars just when то есть когда фрукты уже поспели, они зеленые положить в ящики и потом два месяца где-то на складе их держать, что вот свежесобранные спелые сладкие фрукты привезти Market, uh, not only business. <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, Unmanned delivery systems, cargo drones. Uh, there are all kinds of how technology enables different vehicles, but aircraft design is mission specific. So we are designing an aircraft that can carry 400 kilograms, and this is for people and. If we think about cargo, maybe that's not the optimal batch. 400 kilograms may not be the optimal batch for delivery networks. And we have to be very specific about which industry we are addressing as a, as a startup. So we are essentially a pas passenger jet engineers who do the new type of vehicle for, as we believe, the mass use and mass market for our vehicles uh, is, is urban, mass urban aviation, shared networks, but also that is something that will change our lives dramatically. Because delivery, delivery systems will not so visibly change the way we, like, we live uh, compared to a scenario where we, instead of spending an hour in traffic, will be able to spend only 10 minutes. That's our focus. Basically, it's also our choice, if you like, where, which, on what to work. 
statics in the air. Just. Everybody's thinking about this, and um, uh, safety, uh, the, the general concept is, if you've ever used aircraft, if you've ever used any a real vehicle, safety measures or safety requirements will never be compromised. So if you, if you feel safe on board of, a, of, a, of an aircraft, you will, say, you will feel safe here. It's, it's the same passenger aviation sort of high standards of safety that will be applied. Um, I can imagine that, yes. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thank oh. you for the presentation. Uh, uh, you said that uh, hydrogen uh, fuel, uh, you talked about uh, an advantage of hydrogen uh, fuel, and, but it's a fact we know that. Uh, for example, hydrogen cars aren't competitive if we compare them with all electric battery powered cars. Uh, like Toyota, Hyundai, they are not competitive. Uh, on, which, on which measures are they not competitive? Mm -hmm. uh, they are not so good, it's the uh, best metric, I think. Uh, and uh, also, uh, your competitors aren't using, uh, as I know, all of them are using battery. Uh, so, what is the reason that uh, hydrogen uh, uh, doesn't succeed in the competition? Well, uh, first thing, uh, just, just, to, just to clear things up, I mean, we are powered by lithium. I was saying that uh, there are aircraft designs where lithium batteries are scattered all over the fuselage and you can't trans translate them into, uh, transform them into hydrogen uh, powered vehicles. We can. So whenever uh, hydrogen power fuel cells become affordable, we can, without changing the aircraft design dramatically, uh, just switch over to the new power source, which, which we believe is, is a source of competitive advantage for us, for our design. As regards uh, comparison on competitiveness by sales figures, again, I, th I, 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 I truly believe that it's about availability of infrastructure. In most world cities, there Infrastructure to charge your electric vehicle. In very few cities, there is infrastructure to refuel your hydrogen uh, vehicle, and that drives the sales figures. It's about adoption curves. It's uh, it's about infrastructure. It's about seamless uh, operation uh, of the vehicle. But, but generally speaking, I, I, I do honestly believe that from the technology standpoint and from the use case, if the infrastructure is available, hydrogen cars are much more are much better. They can, I mean, you can refuel them. Uh, and, and hydrogen is a better way to store energy compared to lithium batteries. It has more energy density. It doesn't have an environmental impact. Basically, you can have, imagine you can have solar power, solar um, uh, electric power, then you apply it to water and you get hydrogen out of it. You also get some oxygen, which you can sell to, to, to industrial uh, consumers, but you have hydrogen uh, from, uh, from water. And you just conserve, this is the way you can conserve energy that you derive from the sun. And then you can transport it also, because the, the pressure in the tank is 700 atmospheres. So you can tr transform that energy and then use it very efficiently, sort of roll it back. And what you get in the end? Water again. So it's just the better way to have solar power delivered to where you want to use it. So I do believe that I do believe in hydrogen in, a, in the longer term than just maybe a five uh, next five years. Okay, thank you. And uh, also, uh, I have a question about controlling. Will it will controlling it be like uh, controlling simple drone or uh, manual control? Yes, more or less. Very keen to that, yeah. It's called, it's, it's directional control. So you, you basically control the direction of, of it flying. Uh, unlike in most uh, aircraft, you need to really make it stay airborne. The pilot spends muscle power and brain effort to keep the aircraft airborne. And then on top of that, it has to direct it to where it wanted to fly. So the first task will be removed. Well, it will be, yeah, it's, it's, it's facilitated flight uh, or augmented uh, pilot, augmented flight and then full autonomy. And full autonomy uh, will come next. It will, uh, it will be autonomy by waypoints, basically when you simply 
let it know GPS coordinates and it flies there, or uh, autonomy by intelligent instruction, where you basically can give an instruction, go somewhere in the center of Yerevan and make sure you know where, uh, where our man is and try to land as close to him, notify by phone where you landed, pick him up and bring him back to me. The kind, of, kind of this instruction can be feasible. It, and, and technology is more or less there for, for even that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello. Thank you for the presentation. It was really cool to see all these parallels between all these old pictures and our reality. The question regarding the funding. So it's, it sounds like a huge project. So how you are planning to get funding for implementation? Because one thing to make a prototype Another thing to make, like a factory type of baking. Well, uh, as, as we discussed about two uh, uh, areas of work. One area of work is Bartini, and we are, we are just ordinarily funded uh, by angel investors, and we are, after the, fl after the test flights are finished, and we are now in the test flights where we flew the vehicle, we crashed it, we are repairing it now, we will finalize our sort of um, uh, program of test flights and then we'll have the next round of investments to bring about the next scaled uh, vehicle. If we speak about McFly, it's a joint effort of so many people. So all the participants of McFly are independently funded companies and uh, we can sustain that um, uh, activity to sort of understand how our, te our technologies merge together and can be given to people worldwide as a tool to make their own business. At the same time, it's also a crowd uh, kind of, anybody can participate in that project because the more people participate uh, in different places of the world, the more talent, the more feedback, the more pace, the more of everything. So it's, it's kind of a, 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 a societal effort. So you're trying to do maybe some ICOs to get also offer coining for McFly? Well, it, it, it is indeed, uh, there is indeed McFly token and it is, uh, there is a token launch uh, going on for, well, since November last year, so yes, the, this process is there as well, yes. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.